Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. I am Manuel Aragon. I am the Community Engagement Manager at Lighthouse Writers Workshop. And this is our visitors visiting authors reading and conversation featuring Emily Rapp Black, Jaquita Diaz, and T. Kira Madden. Before I introduce our readers, a couple of quick announcements. You're not on camera or mic, so please submit your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, also, live transcriptions available should you find it helpful. So you can hide or view the subtitles by clicking on the CC button below. You'll find links to all of our upcoming readings in the chat bar, including tomorrow night's reading and conversation with Sheila Hetty, Catherine Lacey, and Sarah Rule as well as links to purchase books by our readers tonight. I'd like to thank the SCFD, National Endowment for the Arts in Colorado Creative Industries for helping to make LitFest 2021 possible. A special thanks to Bookbar, our official bookselling partner this year. And now our first reader. Emily Rapp Black is the author of Poster Child, a memoir, and The Still Point of the Turning World a New York Times bestseller and an editor's pick, as well as a finalist for the Penn USA Award in nonfiction. A former Fulbright scholar, she was educated at Harvard University, Trinity College of Dublin, St. Olaf College, and the University of Texas, Austin, where she was a James A. Missioner Fellow in Fiction and Poetry. The recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, she has received awards and fellowships from the Rana Jaff Foundation, the Gentle Arts Foundation, the Corporation of Yado, Fine Arts Work Center, where she was a Winter Writing Fellow, Fundacion Valparaiso, and Bucknell University, where she was the Philip Roth Fiction Writer in Residence. Her work has appeared in Vogue, The New York Times, Daisy, The Times London, Lenny Letter, The Sun, Time, The Boston Globe, The Wall Street Journal, Good Housekeeping, O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, The Los Angeles Times, and other publications and anthologies. Her essays about end-of-life care and palliative care appear frequently in medical and academic journals and anthologies. The mother of two children, Ronan and Charlotte, she lives in the Inland Empire in Southern California. Emily? Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, introduction and thank you to the other readers. I'm so honored to be reading with you and thank you to Lighthouse for having me back. I'm a repeat offender. So I'm gonna read from uh, my book that's coming out in June called Frida Kahlo and My Left Leg. Here's a visual. It has its own bookmark. Um, and so this book grew out of my, um, my kind of uh, interest and in curiosity in Frida Kahlo from a very young age. So the book is an interrogation of like disability, art, fetish, sex, um, memory, all of those things. And my, my parents are in, entering the house, so there may be some um, talking. Uh, and so I'm gonna read actually just from the prologue, which sort of sets up the, the focus of the book. Um, this grew out of an essay that I wrote, I called it the Angry Death Essay, that I wrote a couple of years ago. Um, this is definitely the hardest book I've ever written. It's the shortest book I've ever written. And it was the latest book that I've ever delivered. Yay. All right, so this is the prologue. And it starts with an epigraph. What you say, you say in a body. You can say nothing outside of this body. That's by Wittgenstein. Desnudo de Frida Kahlo, a lithograph by Diego Rivera, hangs in a light-filled gallery in a small museum in Guanajuato, Mexico. In this portrait, Frida's torso is taut and slim the sides of her waist curve inward, creating perfect hollows for each of your hands. Her breasts are soft and firm, slightly lifted, because her arms are clasped behind her head. Her elbows are the painted tips of wings. The likeness is that observant, that meticulous and loving in its detail. This body is deeply known, fully seen, and so elevated that you can imagine it moving into positions outside the frame in real time and in other places. Two looped strands of large dark beads hang just below her collarbone. Her shoulders look solid, strong, able. This is a body that is loved, admired, desired. Frida's eyes are cast downward, half shuddered as if she's in mid thought. Perhaps she is enjoying her body and the adoration it evokes from her love. 
this extraordinary body, this remarkable image, beautiful when she had already weathered so much. This lithograph was made in 1930 after polio disfigured her right foot in 1913 when she was six years old, after the 1925 streetcar accident that broke her spinal column, her collarbone, her ribs, her pelvis, created 11 fractures in her already weakened leg, crushed her foot, and left her shoulder permanently out of joint. During the 29 years between her accident and her death in 1954, Frida had 32 operations, was required to wear a corset every day from 1944 onward, and had her leg amputated as a result of gangrene in 1953. It was this final operation that likely led to the complications that eventually killed her. Speculation of suicide remains. As an artist, Frida is famous for translating her pain into art, but people rarely know the full details of what she endured and what such an enterprise of translation might require. Many of her millions of, of admirers across the globe do not realize that she was an amputee during that last part of her life and that all her life, her body was a canvas constantly shifting. At one point, she was hung upside down to strengthen her spinal column. Her body was wired and rewired bracketed and captured and restrained and corseted in an attempt to be hemmed in, to stop her muscles and bones and joints from collapsing into chaos. She was as familiar with the edge of a scalpel as she was with the tip of a paintbrush. Here in Diego's 1930 likeness, her legs are thickly muscled, almost masculine. Sheer stockings hug her legs from the calves all the way to her upper thighs stopping just short of the shaded tangle of hair between her legs. She appears soft, but also invincible, a lovely live wire and careful repose. There is no invitation in her posture, only choice, a reflection of the serenity and eroticism and intimate power of absolute trust. A woman who is willing to be seen by this artist, this man, fully and completely. Frida met Diego 20 years her senior in 1922 when she was 15 years old. He had been commissioned to paint a mural at the National Preparatory School in Mexico City, where her program of study was meant to lead to medical school. This, one of Diego's first murals, was called Creation, and Frida walked past his larger-than-life interpretation at the beginning of the world, day after day for years. As an amputee since the age of four, I have always wondered what it would be like to have memories of two flesh and blood legs. I've always wanted someone to see me the way that Frida is seen in this lithograph. I long for a concrete, active memory of walking and running on two legs, looking at them, crossing them, spreading them, although I know this remembering would be painful. I long for the extraordinary confidence that allows Frida to be seen by the viewer without looking back to see if the body is okay, if it is offensive, if it is grotesque. But the memory of life lived on two legs is unavailable to me within the conscious process of remembering. The desired body that I long for is a fiction and its aspiration is pointless. When I see these legs on this woman's body whose image is mounted on this wall, taken by a man who loved her, a body that will lose part of itself 20 years after it was created, a body that has already known pain as few others have known or will ever know, I feel a longing for Frida herself, for her friendship, for her guidance, for her love across time and culture and experience. The first time I saw Frida's painting, The Two Fridas, I felt the impact in the intimate landscape of skin between my real leg and my fabricated leg. That small, hardworking patch of flesh that touches what is connected during the day and disconnected at night. For so long, I explained to people that it was like having two Emilys, living in two bodies, one for the day, one for the night. And when I saw The Two Fridas in an art book my brother's college girlfriend brought home during Christmas break, I thought, yes, I thought, you see me. I thought, this is true. It was 1991 and I was still in high school. I went to the library and found every book I could about Frida and read them in a quiet corner as snowflakes slowly twisted to the ground on the other side of the window and the sounds of public enemy screeched through my Walkman headphones. Many of the books mentioned that Frida was debilitated by her pain. They talked about how much and how long she suffered. And yet all these paintings, all this output, all this art, all this beauty. I knew the pain was not amused, so what sustained her? The Two Fridas was not about suffering, it was about imagination and connection, and that word my parents had started to use with me, self-love, which I was supposed to be practicing was not. I had no model, I knew no female bodies like my own. That's it. Sorry about the noise. Thank you so much, Emily.
That was wonderful. Our next reader tonight is Shakira Diaz. Shakira was born in Puerto Rico and raised in Miami. She's the author of Ordinary Girls, a memoir, the summer fall 2019 Indies introduced selection, the fall 2019 Barnes and Noble Discovery, Discovery Great New Writer Selection, a November 2019 Indie Next Pick, and a Library Reads October Pick. Her second book, I Am Deliberate, a novel, is forthcoming from Algonquin Books. Her work, her work has been published in Rolling Stone, The Guardian, The Fader, T, The New York Times Style Magazine, and The Best American Essays 2016, among other publications. She's the recipient of two Pushcart Prizes, an Elizabeth George Foundation Grant, a Florida Individual Artist Fellowship, an Individual Excellence Award from the Ohio Arts Council, an NEA Fellowship to the Cambridge Center for the Arts, and fellowships from McDowell Colony, and in review, the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing, Swanee Writers Conference, Kent House Summer Writers Workshop, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, the Ragsdale Foundation, and Breadloaf Writers Conference. A former visiting assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin, Madison MFA program in creative writing, a consulting editor at the Kenyon Review. She splits her time between Montreal and Miami Beach with her partner, the writer of Lawrence Park. Akina? Hi, thank you so much for that very long bio. Um, um, can everyone hear me? Can everybody hear me? Um, okay, so uh, I just wanna say thank you so much, uh, Manuel. Thank you to the Lighthouse Writers Workshop. And uh, thank you, Emily and Takira. I'm so excited to be reading with you today. I'm going to be reading um, just a short bit from Ordinary Girls, which is um, my debut book, which came out in 2019. Um, it's a memoir about growing up with a mother who suffered from mental illness, but also about um, my community, about the girls who saved me growing up. And I'm going to be reading a very short section in the very opening of the book, and then a very short section right in the middle of the book. So this is right in the beginning. Girlhood. We were the girls who strolled onto the blacktop on long summer days, dribbling past the boys on the court. We were the girls on the merry-go-round, laughing and laughing and letting the world spin while holding on for our lives. The girls on the swings, throwing our heads back, the wind in our hair. We were the loud mouths, the troublemakers, the practical jokers. We were the party girls hitting the clubs in booty shorts and high top Jordans, smoking blunts on the beach. We were the wild girls who loved music and dancing. Girls who were black and brown and poor and queer. Girls who loved each other. I have been those girls on a Greyhound bus, homeless and on the run, a girl sleeping on lifeguard stands behind a stilt house restaurant on a bus stop bench, a hoodlum girl throwing down with boys and girls and their older sisters and even the cops, suspended every year for fighting on the first day of school, kicked out of music class for throwing a chair at the math teacher's son, kicked off two different school buses, kicked out of pre-algebra for stealing the teacher's grade book, a girl who got slammed onto a police car by two cops in front of the whole school after a brawl with six other girls. And I have been other girls, girl standing before a judge, girl on a dock the morning after a hurricane, looking out at the bay like it's the end of the world, girl on a rooftop, girl on a ledge, girl plummeting through the air. And years later, a woman writing letters to a prisoner on death row. And the girls I ran with, half of them I was secretly in love with, street girls who were escaping their own lives, trading the chaos of home for the chaos on the streets. One of them had left home after being molested by a family member, lived with her brother most of the time. Another had two babies before she was a junior in high school and decided they were better off with a father a man in his 30s. Only one had what I thought was a perfectly good set of parents at home, a dad who owned a restaurant and paid for summer vacations abroad, 
a mom who planned birthday parties and cooked dinner. They were girls who fought with me, smoked out with me, got arrested with me, girls who snuck into clubs with me, terrorized the neighborhood with me, got jailhouse tattoos with me, girls who picked me up when I was stranded and brought me food when I was starving who sat with me outside the emergency room after my boy was stabbed in a street fight, who held me and cried with me at my abuela's funeral. Hood girls who were strong and vulnerable, who taught me about love and friendship and hope. Sometimes in dreams, I return to those girls, those places, and we are still there, all of us, roller skating on the boardwalk, laying out our beach towels on the sand, dancing to Missy Elliott's work it under the full moon. We are women now, those of us who are alive, the ones who made it. For a while there, we didn't know if any of us would. And um, the next section is kind of in the middle of the book in a chapter called Candy Girl. And it's a very short section. We kept each other's secrets, wiped each other's tears, protected each other. We passed notes during class. We told each other everything, our fantasies and our crushes, the latest argument with our parents, the TLC concert we've been saving up for, the guy who confessed his love while we rode the bus together on a Friday after school. We sat together in the cafeteria, found each other in the hallways. We harmonized to shies, if I ever fall in love, or en vogue's hold on. While we waited for the bell to ring, we went on missions together, cutting class and catching the bus to the mall or the flea market or the beach, singing Whitney in the back of the bus. We snuck out to salsa music festivals at Bayfront Park on the weekends, turning each other to Andy Montañez's Casi Te Envidio and Frankie Ruiz Mi Libertad until the park closed. We went to birthday parties at Hot Wheels where we strapped on rented roller skates and cruised around La Pista with the disco lights, shaking it to two live crew. We wore short shorts and crop tops, baggy jeans and basketball jerseys, big hoop earrings. And no matter what, everybody had opinions about how we dressed, called us tomboys or hood rats or fast girls. Our shorts were too short, our jeans too tight, too baggy, our voices too loud. Everybody wanted to control what we wore, what we did, who we did it with. We were not the girls they wanted us to be. We were not allowed to talk like this, to want like this. We were not supposed to feel the kind of desire you feel at 13, at 14. What kind of girl they loved to say? What kind of girl, even as they took what we gave, took what we tried to hold on to? our voices, our bodies. We were trying to live, but the world was doing its best to kill us. We would have boyfriends. We would have boyfriends that didn't last the year, the month, the week, older guys who didn't go to school, who drove Broncos and Camaros and Cutlass Supremes. We would hide them from our parents, our friends' parents. When we got tired of them, we would break it off, but sometimes they wouldn't go. And instead they'd show up at the pool or the movie theater or the roller skating rink uninvited, asking to talk to us just one last time. We were 13, 14, 15, and they were men in their twenties. And no matter how we said no, they would keep coming back until we had babies or abortions. And then they would leave. We were girls, but we'd spend the rest of our days together if we could until one day we realized that without meaning to, we grew up, grew apart, broke each other's hearts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jagita. That was a wonderful reading. Our final reader tonight is T. Kira Mahayalani Madden. T. Kira Madden is a Chinese Kanaka Maoli writer, photographer, and amateur magician, a recipient of fellowships from the New York Foundation for the Arts, Hedgebrook, Tin House, McDowell, and Yaddo, where she was awarded the Linda Collins Endowed Residency Award. She serves as the founding editor-in-chief of No Tokens, a magazine of literature and art. She is the author of the 2019 New York Times Editor's Choice Memoir, 
Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls, which is now being developed as a feature film. A finalist for the New York, for the National Books Critic Circle Award, John Leonard Prize, and the winner of the 2021 Judith A. Markowitz Lambda Literary Award. She has facilitated writing workshops for homeless and formerly incarcerated individuals and will join the Department of English at College of Charleston in fall 2021. T. Kira. Hi, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? I guess we can't actually see responses to that. Um, thank you so much, Lighthouse. Uh, thank you, Jakira and Emily. An honor, true honor um, to be reading with you and tough acts to follow, I will say. Um, thank you everyone for being here tonight. And also a big shout out to my amazing workshop class. Um, you've all taught me so much this week and it's been truly such a joy and an honor to, to be here. Um, because of some of what we've talked through in our workshop this week, I thought I would read just a very short piece um, from this issue of Pen America. It's the mythologies issue. Um, so this is not from my book, which is, looks like this, Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls, but it is very book adjacent. Uh, it might as well be in that book. This is called Before He Died, My Father Took Me to the Olympics. I wanted to be Dominique Mochianu because she was white and not Dominique Dawes because she was not white and definitely not Amy Chow because she was me, me but proud. She was my cuter cousin at the dinner table. She was someone who could move. Growing up, I was called flat, I was called boy, I was called Twinkie Chinky, and I said, I'm going to be a gymnast someday because that's what real kids are made of. Myth of girl, myth of body, those diamond cut tumblers, and I rolled up towels on the floor of our camper and pretended the padded scrolls were balance beams, and I stuck every goddamn landing as my father watched on. Dominique Mochianu, Dominique Dawes, Amy Chow, Shannon Miller, Amanda Borden, J.C. Phelps, Carrie Strug, whose one-footed vault still surprises me 22 years later, how I loved them. In Hawaiian, there's a term for a swollen drop of rain at the tip of a leaf. The eyes when they wobble with shine before any tears fall. It's halo koloko. Crying is a different word entirely. Here's what I can tell you about my father as a person. Everyone who ever met him remembered him. He told long, expansive jokes with questionable accents, and when he told them, the whole room laughed like hell. He carried around a wad of cash so thick and bulky that airport security once hand-checked every layer of it, and for nine years of my adult life, he met me at the movie theater every Saturday morning. He was brilliant. In the summer of 1996, he took me to the Atlanta Olympics to see those gymnasts. He worked until he died, and he was never late. Here's what else about him. He was an addict. He was stubborn and sexist. At times and at the peak of his addictions, he was abusive. He kept secrets, whole siblings, plural from me. And for several years before he married her, my mother was his mistress. I was another one of his secret children. He taught me how to gamble in Vegas at five years old. And the first time I have a drink in a casino, creme de menthe and milk, I am six, the silky green liquid matching my dress exactly. But let me try again. Let me reach through the years for the facts. Once my father was Coach Bella Caroli. Once he described all the ways I might become a person, a fancier, beautiful woman. I sat on his lap and he said, even though you're not a boy, you will shine, you will cook, you will marry a good man, and you will have the strength of a whole island inside of you. I never became a gymnast. I can't even touch my toes. I did propose to a woman at a gas station in Edmond, Oklahoma, Shannon Miller's hometown on the way to a prairie burn. When we saw that sign, hometown of Olympian Shannon Miller, I said, hey, did you know I once wanted to be a gymnast? And she didn't, but my body felt so big inside of that confession, I bought two mood rings for 75 cents, kneeled down into the gasoline kissed concrete and said, marry me. The red of burning is a different word than the red of meat, the red of twilight intervals, the red of a blushing face, the red slant of rain, the red of the newly deceased, ua punoho, I like that one best. But I came to this story for my father, 
I don't know the beginning and ends of him yet, or the beginning and ends of this astonishing sadness, or why my dead father makes me want to watch every hour of this Olympic still, because he rented that camper, and we drove all the way up to Atlanta, and the bomb shattered off in Centennial Park, and he promised to protect me, promised that our team would win, carried me tight against his chest when he pretended to be Coach Bella Caroli and said, you can do it, son, like I could be that kind of person. Carrie Strug, she got the gold. I only know I was not his son. I only know that after someone dies, no one prepares you for the dreams. I know that my father had a son after me whom I've never met, though I bet they have the same nose. I heard that boy grew up to be a musician and never, ever an athlete. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, T. Kira. And I'll have Shakira and Emily come back. Hi. Hi. <laughs> well, I'm going to start with a few questions, but if anyone has any questions, you can throw those in the chat. And I think for the for the three of you, as I, I'm somebody who my, my writing tends to be just strictly fiction. And so I really marvel at those of you who write really amazing creative nonfiction. And so my, my question is just how, I, I know that all three of you move between fiction and nonfiction and really how your brain and how you're able to do that in your writing and just uh, can maybe talk about that process a little bit. I think we were talking about it a little bit. Well, not, not about the process itself, but before um, the show started, um, Takira and I talked a little bit about how fiction, it feels like playing in a, in a way. Um, at least for me, it feels, nonfiction feels like I'm digging and digging and doing a lot of work. And when I have my fiction brain on, it feels like, oh, even if I'm digging and digging, it's a lot easier. Um, it feels like play, like I'm not, I'm emotionally invested, but nonfiction, it's a different kind of investment. It feels like I have a sense of responsibility when I'm writing about real people um, and characters, I can just kill them. <laughs> <laughs> right, bye. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like that, that, like what you said, and I think actually both of you read and that, what I really admired about the way that those those words landed and that narrative landed is that it shows so much how and um, like your particular positionality in the world in a body informs the way that you experience the world and i think that's what readers want they want to feel like um they are learning something about being human in a way that they never would otherwise and that certainly can happen in fiction but i think just knowing the person was or is alive is is changes the changes the tenor of the of the experience. I I don't know. It's all so hard for me. <laughs> um, but something that we talked about today in class a little bit was that um, if you're going to write about someone in nonfiction, a real person in the world, I think there's a responsibility to really try to get at that dynamic self, that dynamic person, rather than you know, the flat characters of this person was, you know, an abuser or a villain of some kind. And sometimes I can't access the full self, the full person, if I'm trying to write about them, but I can in fiction because I'm able to think through what that backstory is and, you know, build dynamism through other scenes and through other, you know, peripheral people in their, in their worlds where in my real life, um, do I have closure? Could I be fair to some people, not always. So it's also a way for me to access, um, I don't know, a deeper empathy sometimes in, in fiction. That makes sense. Thank you all. So a question from the audience, your books are also deeply personal. Can you talk about what you do to take care of yourself as you excavate your memories, mining them for material for your work? I can answer that. It's going to be a bit of a shock. Not really. I mean, it, um, I write my memoir to actually maintain my privacy. 
And I mean that because if you have a story that kind of stops a conversation um, or people are like, how are you still alive? Which is something that some people ask me all the time which I think is super rude, but also whatever. Um, then I'm like, oh, well, actually here's a narrative. I wrote it and you can engage with it on the page and you can stop talking to me. <laughs> like, I think that's really important. I mean, I, I think if you have a disability or if you have a body that's non-normative, people are asking you rude questions in public places your entire life. And I never knew that I was allowed to say no more. And when I became a writer, I was like, ooh. Like now that I've written this thing, I can say like, well, actually, if you really wanna know the details about how far this goes up, right? Or what I do with my leg when I shower, stranger, you can read this book. And then we don't have to have any kind of conversation. Cause, and, and so I feel like it's kind of a wall. It's a wall for me and I think it's become more and more so as, as the older I've gotten and the more nonfiction I've written. I don't know, and people are always like, that doesn't make any sense, but it makes sense to me. So that's why I do it, part of why I do it. Um, and I think I didn't start even thinking about how to take care of myself until after I'd finished this book. Um, I think I had this strange idea that I could just write and live my life and be okay. And then, you know, I wrote about trauma um, and abuse and it wasn't, it wasn't until after um, the book was out that I realized um, this is not sustainable. I have to, I have to do something else to take care of myself. And so I started therapy. Um, I've been in therapy a long time and um, I meditate, I exercise, I do therapy. I feel like I have to wake up and that has to be my priority, my mental health, my, you know, my, my actual life. Um, and that the work is second. The work comes after I've taken care of myself, after the meditation and the exercise and the therapy and, you know, making sure that my mental health and my physical health, that I'm okay. Um, and then I'm more productive and then I actually enjoy what I'm working on rather than having it feel like torture. <laughs> Um, but I think I learned that too late. I wish that I had done that years and years ago. Yeah. Um, wow. Everything you both just said really resonates with me, uh, Emily. I, I've never really been able to articulate exactly that, but that's so true um, that it does feel like you can, you can use this as this document and like, here's the story. And lately I've been thinking about as someone who grew up in the household I grew up in, in kind of a tumultuous, abusive household, that my memoir is the first time I've been able to um, articulate my experience without being interrupted. And that feels really good that I'm, you know, a very shy person. I'm not the person who would be able to say, this is how I've experienced this day or this incident. But through my book, I can do that. There's no one who can interrupt the text of my book. Um, someone can put the book down, but I don't have to know about that. So that does feel like a little bit of self-care and same with, you know, there is, you know, Jakira and I have talked a lot about um, the, the reduction when people say like, oh, it's just cathartic. It's just a journal when you're writing about your life. Um, and that feels terrible, but there is something to taking these pieces and allowing yourself to arrange them in new ways and to add style to them and to add pauses. And there is some control that you can assert over those those memories were traumatic memories that does feel really good if you think about it that way, that you're offering grace to some experiences that otherwise wouldn't have that, that artfulness or that beauty um, if you weren't actually making this and constructing it. And it's a gift in that way to yourself and I think to your readers. Thank you all for, for sharing that. And let's see, so another one from the audience. Uh, so I mentioned your fiction writing, but you all write with such stunning lyricism. Does the lyricism open up parts of your stories that would otherwise feel inaccessible, too personal, or in some way uh, too difficult to unearth? Or are you all just poets in disguise? I feel like I started off as a wannabe poet. Um, my father was a poet and my, my father was a wannabe poet and uh, studied literature. And I grew up in a house where my father was always everywhere he went, he had a book. And I wanted, to me, it felt like there was some magic in there that I wanted, right? Um, and so I 
was I always wanted to be a writer. I always wanted to have something to do with books, but my my introduction to that was poetry. Um, and I tried to write poetry. I went to school and, and really tried. I mean, I failed. I can't write poetry. And so um, in when I'm writing nonfiction, I'm always reading poetry and listening to poets read their work. And I feel like even just trying to write poetry, I'm accessing something that I wouldn't be if I were just, if I wasn't even aware that, you know, poets do something that's very different from what fiction writers do. Um, when I'm thinking about poetry, I feel like my work changes and the way that I write changes. I tend to think of um, poetry and music as connected. And um, I studied music as a kid. And I still think of myself as I'm writing as uh, kind of like I'm a composer thinking about music and sound. Um, in, in a way, I think that maybe a poet would think about sound and thinking of as like the sentence as a unit of composition in a way. Um, so yes, I would say that I'm not a poet in disguise, but a wannabe poet. I am also a wannabe poet. I'm right there with you um, <laughs> because of the magic. It's exactly what you said. And I think I read so much poetry and I think it's, I'm always just like, how are they doing this? So annoying. Like, how are they doing this in one page? Uh, I also uh, was trained as an opera singer. I wasn't very good, but uh, that really resonates with me too. Just this idea that like rhythm and music and patterning is like so important in nonfiction. And I always tell students that are like, oh, you know, what do I do if I want to write more lyrically? I'm like, just read so, they read all the poetry you can. First of all, you can do it more quickly in a way, but it'll stay with you this in this different way. And it'll it'll inform the way that you frame the experience and narrative. Yeah, I owe everything to the poets. I'm a lousy poet. My lyricism disappears if I try to write a poem. I think I've written three and they're just so terrible. <laughs> I put on a poet hat and it's it's not good. But um, I too studied uh, music. I was a drummer growing up and I wanted to be a jazz drummer. And I don't think about that as I'm writing, but I think that percussive you know, ear and like sensibility is still there of, of meter and beat. Um, and it's something I, I care a great deal about, I think. Um, I wouldn't say to answer that beautiful question that lyricism helps me access anything um, that wouldn't be there, but it's definitely the way I work through, like I can't start a piece until I hear the music of it. Like very literally, I get a line or I get a refrain or something and I hear the beat of it. And then I know what the music will be of that piece. And I know what the style will therefore be because having the story for me is never enough. Like we all have infinite stories. We could write a story about anything, um, but then adding like that texture or like the, the song or the music or uh, the color, whatever it is that you, bring to the page like for me it's the sound I have to find the song thank you all for sharing that um let's see so this question from the audience so when you were writing do you have it somewhere in the range of your perception that you are an example to young people helping them to see they can pull down many of the boundaries that have stood for too long and also including some of the real hardships that yet continue? Or do you tend to stay more within your own space and what comes out is inadvertently strong, your own healing channel through your work? I'm gonna have a go at that. Um, I'm not sure I actually believe in healing, which is maybe not a very popular thing to say. I, do, I believe in integration. I believe we integrate things that happen to us in a way that makes them livable, but I'm not sure that's healing. Um, and I would say that I, I don't I don't have that in mind. I have in mind a reader, you know, I, I write books, I think for the people who I think need the book. Like I write for the person that, like when I'm going through an experience or went through an experience as a kid, I was like, I wish I had a book to go to look at while I was doing that. So I write that book. Um, and that's kind of where all of my books generate from. For example, like, you know, growing up with a disability, the books I was given were basically like someone got cancer and died or someone became like a mountain climber. I was like, hmm, this is not very like, there's not a lot of range here. And so I think that's, that was the first sort of gem of it. I don't know. I think um, 
I am very resistant to the idea that that nonfiction is instructive in any way about behavior. I just sort of feel like I would never tell anyone to do what I did. Um, I just, I want to document an experience that has some kind of something terrible and true about it and, and hope that that makes the person feel more human and however that manifests. But, but I, don't, I don't necessarily keep that in mind. I think for me, that would probably stop me from, from saying the truth in a way. I might be worried about how it would land. Yeah, I have to say, I feel similarly. If you were to tell 14, 13, 14 year old Jakira that she was going to be an example for young people, she'd laugh in your face. She'd be like, what are you talking about? Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily think about being an example. I don't necessarily think about um, teaching anyone anything. I do think think about all the ways that I write about a, a very marginalized community and what it means um, to people who grew up in the housing projects like I did to see themselves represented in a book. I think about that. Um, but I don't think that I am an example for any of them. I think, um, I think I, similarly to what Emily was saying that I feel like I, write the books that I needed to read um, because they don't necessarily exist in the world. And, and also right now, I'm thinking much more about writing toward joy and writing something that brings me joy um, and writing about love, good love, and not about trauma and not really thinking about um, this idea of about healing. I don't, I'm like, Emily, I'm not sure that I, do believe in healing and if I did I don't think that it's necessary I don't think that I need to heal um because I would that would suggest that I've broken <laughs> um I think there there are things that are necessary for me to live a life that's meaningful and that is filled with joy um like taking care of myself um like therapy those things but I don't necessarily think that I'm healing I I feel like um, for me, it's more thinking about maintenance and, and maintaining a meaningful and joyous life. Yeah, um, I mean, same here. I think sometimes if you can really focus that on that question of who you're writing for, I think it can be really helpful rather than just this broad like publishers or audience like big big words like that I think can be dangerous sometimes that you you might lose your sense of of purpose and also specificity in what it is you're doing um so I I get lost when I start thinking about a big a big mass of like this is going to help all children or so I can say that writing my memoir um I wrote for the kid version of myself and that might sound a little bit corny but I had a picture of myself as a kid on my desk and everything that felt hard, um, I just thought like, this is the book, this is the storytelling that would make this worth it for this kid who felt like she couldn't survive or go on. Um, and I think it's okay if that person changes project to project or piece by piece. Um, maybe as I've said uh, to my class, it could be a real person or an imagined person, or it could be a community like the queer community, the Asian American community, whatever is important to that piece. And for you in that moment, um, if you're writing to them, I think maybe you can maintain more of that specificity, knowing that those people are going to be rooting for you. And that's like your just if they're your audience that you're holding in your in your hand and your heart, um, I think I think that's great. But I think the more specific you can be um, on who that person is, dead or alive, real or imagined, the better. Rather than this mass, I will help people. Um, I think that's when we lose sight of maybe what what the specificity of our stories are. Um, I also want to add to that. I think it's important for me to always think of what I'm doing as making art. Um, and not just helping people. Um, sometimes, you know, art helps me, but I don't think an artist intends that. I think of when I'm writing, whether I'm writing fiction or nonfiction, I'm always very aware that I'm turning, you know, bits of my life or characters or plot, whatever, into art. And that takes on a completely different meaning for me. 
Thank you all for sharing that. Let's see, we, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, but this one is uh, for, for all of you who, uh, as you call yourself, uh, want to be poets. Um, wh where should we start? What, where, what is some of your favorite go-to poetry? Wow, <laughs> it, it depends, but um, it depends on the day. So um, I, right now I'm loving Jericho Brown's The Tradition. Um, I loved um, Danica Kelly's Bestiary mm -hmm. and she has another book coming out or that just came out actually that I haven't gotten to yet, but I'm looking forward to that. Um, off the top of my head, let me see. <laughs> writers are in, <laughs> y'all, writers are infamous for it. If you ask them for any book list on the spot, you can't remember a single book you've ever read. <laughs> I was going to say Danika Kelly's new book too is amazing. Um, we will send, I can send a list. <laughs> no, I'm the same way. I, I mean, can't I do that on the spot. I can only think of my, my colleague and my friend from in the way back, Katie Ford, who's someone who I've known for, I don't know, 25 plus years. And I think her work really opens up things for me, partly because I know her and partly because I read drafts of her poetry. So that's a real privilege too, to be able to like see drafts of poems of your friends and think, how are you doing this? Um, so I would say that, that my, my poetry inclinations are sometimes in terms of my own writing, people that I that I'm familiar with and know. And I, I never realized that actually until now. And I, I really like that it, it expands my universe and it, it challenges me in this very, I think, intimate, interesting way. Oh, I also have to shout out my wife, Hannah Beresford, who's a brilliant poet. I would feel terrible if I didn't do that. She is my favorite poet. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, this one is about, so we've hit poetry. This one's about craft. Uh, can you please talk a, about a craft challenge you had to master in order to tell the story you wanted to tell? I mean, I'll speak to that. I think, I think, I think for me, one of the craft challenges is that often when people who are having an, a non-normative body experience, however that, that manifests, are pushed towards writing trauma. Like I really think that idea um, of writing towards joy is incredibly important. That to me is always a craft challenge because I feel like I want to say within this difficult experience is joy, within this this non unfixable experience is light. And I think sometimes people resist that because it means that they have to imagine what it might be like if something happened to them. So that to me is always a bit of a challenge. And I definitely have had, you know, difficult conversations with editors or whatever about, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna do the, it's not all about trauma. Like even the most difficult situation is just not, it's not pure trauma. In, for me, and like that's speaking from my own experience, and it's really important for me. And I think too, like in the communities that I teach and in the disabled community, especially, like we're really pushed to have that narrative forward. And and I think that it's powerful to say, you know, this body is a struggle, but it's also mine, and there's some beauty in it as well. And like recognize that also. Thank you. I, so I completely agree with that. I think um, one of the things that was a struggle for me was when I was writing about a very specific time um, in the book that where something traumatic did happen and there was sexual violence to also convey this idea that even though that happened, that this was also a time that was exhilarating and there was a lot of joy and love and music and um, that it wasn't all trauma, that there was some ugliness and there was some beauty and all the ways that our experience and the place where we lived was made up of all these complicated things, including joy. Um, I think that was very difficult for me to do, to think about. Um, I think right now, 
to mention um, one of my favorite poets, Hanif Abdurraqib, who wrote um, a beautiful collection of essays um, that merges essay with um, criticism, with cultural criticism, and wrote about the death of his mother. And in an essay called In the Summer of 1997, um, Everyone Took to the Streets in Shiny Suits that I love to teach because one of the things that he does is he talks about the death, the death of his mother as, you know, as we all know, having lost someone, but also talks about how he found incredible joy and only discovered it after the death of his mother um, and how he would like to tell her that, like that there was also incredible joy and this, you know, something amazing happened after his mother's death. And he's not sure that it would have happened if she hadn't died, right? That grief can be um, grief and painful, but it can also, you know, conjure all these other feelings, including joy. Yeah, I think for memoirists, the constant reminder that we are more than the worst things that have happened to us. Um, and to, I have to remind myself of that every day. And I, I always feel that you know, imposter syndrome, I think, doesn't go away once you publish a book of, you know, are people only interested in this book because it's about bad things that happened to me? And if I wrote about joy, if I wrote about other things, would anybody care? That's something that I have to think about constantly and, and understand that it's not about the trauma, like, like everybody has already said, but more about sensibilities and more about art making and how you see the world, what you notice, how you describe the world, um, what style and voice you bring to it. And I would say most of my, most of it for me, craft challenges, it's really unlearning craft things that I've been taught that a story should look a certain way, or it should carry a certain chronology or the hero's journey or a Western plot arc or all of these things that have been thrown at me and like these very white centered institutions and spaces for my whole life to unlearn that, that like we can write however, however we want to write, we can make art that looks whatever way we want it to look and to ask myself or to, to offer myself that permission every single day when I return to the page, that's the biggest thing I have to overcome. Like you can do whatever the hell you want. Um, and the things that we were taught were not necessarily like the people who decided what big or important literature uh, was or what it is like that is, that's a construct. <laughs> Well, Tikira, that that is the perfect thing to end on. That you know, leave us with that advice. You can do whatever the hell you want. Yes, I love Please that. Please do. <laughs> so, Emily, Jakira, Tikira, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was a great conversation. Thank you for reading for all of us. This was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you all thank you. so much. And thank you, Emily and Takira. It was so lovely to listen to both of you read. I'm going to go out and look for your work. Um, Takira, I already have your book, but I want to get a copy of Pen America where your, where your um, essay appears. That was beautiful. Yeah. Ditto. Thank you all. Congratulations on new books too, both of you. It's so exciting. Thank you. Well, take Thanks take for care. Have a wonderful night. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.